Hallelujah. My name is Art Levin, president of Village Preservation. I hope you enjoyed our first short film from Village Preservation and Doyle Partners Studio. Uh, shout out to Stephen Doyle and Rowan O'Connell sitting over there who labored hard to make this uh, first short. Um, we hope it serves as a reminder to the world why we believe the village is still such a special and enjoyable community for residents and visitors alike. On behalf of Village Preservation, I extend a warm welcome to our members, neighbors, colleagues, and friends this evening, and to the recipients of the 2019 Village Awards, who you will hear more about and get to meet later on. Some of you in the audience may be concerned and confused that you're in the wrong meeting. You set out to attend the annual meeting of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Well, not to worry. You're in the right place. Village preservation is our new moniker introduced earlier this year. And now to business. Alan Sperling, Secretary Treasurer of Village Preservation, has confirmed to me that a quorum of members is in attendance. And in accordance with our bylaws, I now call the 39th annual meeting of the Village Preservation membership to order. Justine Luiziamo, a trustee and co-chair of the nominating committee will next present the committee's 2019 report to the membership. Justine. Uh, Village Preservation's nominating committee is entrusted with the task of searching out new members for our board of trustees and confirming the continued engagement of current trustees whose term is due for renewal. It is now with great pleasure that I present the slate of trustees recommended by the nominating committee to be voted on by the Village Preservation membership this evening. All dues-paying members received a bookmark when you entered to indicate your vote. When I call for the vote, please raise your voting bookmark in the air. The trustees being proposed for a renewed three-year term are as follows. For those trustees who are here tonight, please stand when I say your name. David Hottenroth, Catherine Schoonover, Marilyn Sobel, Naomi Usher, F. Anthony Zunino. All in favor of this slate? Against? The slate is approved. Next, I'm pleased to present one new candidate for a three-year term for the Village Preservation Board, Jean Creer. Jean has lived in the village for 30 years and has served on Village Preservation's Award Committee and Preservation Committee. Since 1996, she has lived on 4th Avenue and 12th Street and has been a neighborhood leader in the fight against the Tech Hub Plan and for neighborhood protections for Greenwich Village and the East Village. All in favor? Against? The slate is approved. Thanks. Thank you, Justine. And I want to thank all the past and present trustees for all the hard work they've invested in village preservation and made us such, such a success over the years. Um, Let me give a brief report on some important activities the board and staff have been involved in over the past year. Um, first is um, over the past 12 months, our board and staff have been hard at work on three important organizational initiatives, all aimed at assuring that we remain sustainable and optimally effective in realizing our mission despite an ever more challenging environment for preservation and landmarking. First, we're on the cusp of finalizing our new lease with St. Mark's Church. The new lease means we will remain at 232 East 11th Street for the foreseeable future. And I'd like to express <laughs> the thanks of the board uh, to Ann Sawyer, the rector of St. Mark's, whose collegiality and commitment 
have made this achievement possible. The second initiative has been our rebranding. Our aim in this undertaking was to achieve a consistent and universally recognizable face across the diverse ways we communicate to our members and to the public. We believe the rebrand is a critical element in growing our future membership and our street cred in the public policy arena. A lot more work remains ahead of us, but the beginning has certainly been exciting for all of us at Village Preservation. And you saw a hint of that in that wonderful short uh, that introduced this evening's. Finally, we've been engaged in a top to bottom updating and upgrading of our website. We anticipate we'll be ready to launch the renovated website before the end of the summer. The goal of the project is to enhance the experience of visitors, both in ease of navigation and expanded content, as well as to reflect our new brand identity. Back to the business at hand. Members in attendance should have received a copy of our audited financial report and met a membership report when they registered out front. If you didn't do so, then there are copies still available when you leave. It's now my great pleasure to call on Andrew Berman, our executive director, to present his annual report. This year marks Andrew's 18th year as our executive director. <laughs> 18 years that have seen us grow, prosper, and achieve great success in carrying out our mission. His tenure has been marked by fearless engagement with those who oppose preservation and landmarking and who, if left to their own devices, would cause serious harm to the look and spirit of the community we treasure. Andrew. Thank you uh, so much, Art. Uh, I don't know how it can be 18 years. I'm only 29. How is that, how is that possible? Um, but first of all, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, like you, I'm very excited for our wonderful awardees, but you've got to sit through a little bit of uh, annual recapping before we get there. Um, I want to first of all start off by thanking and acknowledging GVSHP's or Village Preservation's incredibly hardworking staff, Sam Moskowitz, Linnell Stevens, Sarah Bean Atman, Ariel Cates, Laura Fleischman, and Harry Bubbins. Yes. Well deserved. So this has been a year of celebrations for village preservation, of victories, of firsts, and of growing challenges. One thing that remains unchanged, however, has been the steadfast support of you, our members. As you can see from our annual membership report, our number of dues-paying members, which really forms the backbone of our organization and accounts for well over half of our annual revenue, grew steadily this past year. I and everyone at Village Preservation are incredibly grateful to you for your continued confidence in us. As always, this past year, many of you also supported us at our main fundraising event, our annual spring house tour. A little rain didn't stop us from raising about 20% of our annual budget through this wonderful event that showcases an incredible collection of village houses, culminating in a festive reception afterwards this year at the Urban Zen Center. Thank you to all who attended, and especially our hardworking benefit committee, business supporters, and the more than 130 volunteers who made it possible, many of whom are here tonight. Our house tour helps fund the vast array of largely free programming we produce each year about the special architectural and cultural heritage of our neighborhoods. That includes our children's education program, which expanded its reach this year serving new students not only in our neighborhood, but Upper Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. Using the village as a living museum, we teach school children, regardless of need or ability to pay, how history can be found and appreciated in the built environment around them. We also expanded the reach of our continuing education program, connecting more real estate professionals with some of the city's most esteemed experts on architecture, history, and design, to help ensure that these critical practitioners understand the value of historic preservation and hopefully pass that along to their clients. 
This is just one of many ways village preservation tries to impart to the public an appreciation for our neighborhood's rich histories. Another, of course, is our historic plaque program, which this year marked the home and writing studio of Alex Haley at 92 Grove Street, where he interviewed Malcolm X dozens of times for the autobiography which bore his name. For that unveiling, we were joined by Haley's niece, Malcolm X's daughter, and scholars and experts in the field. In December, we placed a plaque on the former Bell Labs in the West Village, now West Beth, celebrating the complex's groundbreaking role in sound technology innovation, adaptive reuse, and providing housing for artists. This joins more than a dozen other plaques we placed on buildings in our neighborhoods, honoring poet Frank O'Hara, novelist James Baldwin, playwright Lorraine Hansberry, dancer Martha Graham, first woman doctor Elizabeth Blackwell, and many more. Overall, this year we conducted a record-breaking 83 programs with over 7,000 attendees, ranging from walking tours to panel discussions to book talks and lectures. Some of the themes of our programs this year included the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising in the West Village, as well as the 50th anniversary of the designation of the East Village's St. Mark's Historic District. But our biggest engagement project this past year was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Greenwich Village Historic District. When Village Preservation was founded in 1980, our purpose was to serve as a caretaker for the Historic District. Of course, our scope and mission have grown considerably since then, covering all of the Village, East Village, and NoHo, advocating for new landmark and zoning protections, and helping small businesses and cultural institutions. But the Greenwich Village Historic District, still, still the city's largest historic district, remains near and dear to the heart of our mission. Emphasizing why we all benefit from its preservation and from the preservation of other historic areas is a critical part of our mission, and we use the 50th anniversary as an opportunity to share and demonstrate that vision. We partnered with dozens of businesses, houses of worship, schools, theaters, and community organizations within the historic district to throw a 50th anniversary celebration in Washington Square, which was combined with a district-wide weekend-long open house in which thousands participated and got to see why this district is so special and how much it thrives under landmark designation. This has been paired with ongoing programming throughout the year and the release of our Greenwich Village Historic District 1969 to 2019 interactive map, which shows every one of the 2,200 buildings in the district in 1969 at the time of designation and today. The map also contains two dozen tours of the district, including the homes of great artists, writers, and musicians, churches, theaters, and wood frame houses, immigration landmarks, transformative women, and LGBTQ history, and buildings by great architects, ones that inspired Edward Hopper, and those which were the settings for TV shows and movies. We're adding new tours to the map throughout the year, so please check them all out at gvshp.org slash gvhd tour, gvhd50 tour. Earlier this year, we unveil unveiled a similar online tool, our East Village Building Blocks website. More than 10 years in the making, it resulted from literally tens of thousands of hours of research by dozens of village preservation staffers and interns over the past decade. We compiled the history of every single building in the East Village, from when it was built and who by and for, to any major changes to the buildings, significant events that took place there, or people, businesses, or institutions associated with it, and included links to images of the buildings over the years and documents showing its history. This website, like our GVHD50 site, was a labor of love and also includes a growing collection of tours, including the Jewish Rialto, Klein Deutschland, the Ukrainian East Village, off-off-Broadway theaters, and landmarks of punk. Explore it all at gvshp.org slash building blocks. Of course, we don't just celebrate and educate about our neighborhood's history, we advocate for its preservation. At the same time that we launched our Building Blocks website, 
We also released a report by respected architectural historian Francis Moroni about the history and architecture of the East Village. Over the course of its more than 250 pages, that report laid out the case for why the East Village's 350 years of history deserves more attention from the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Absolutely. At the end of last year, we met with the commission to present our findings and urge them to consider expanding landmark protections in the area. We are optimistic that we will begin to see movement in that direction before year's end. We've already seen some great results from some of our prior campaigns this year. After the, the prior Landmarks Preservation Commission chair resigned amid a backlash against her plan to cut the public out of a significant part of the public review process for changes to landmark properties, Village Preservation la launched a campaign to demand that the next LP LPC chair have actual experience in historic preservation. <laughs> something which no chair in decades had. This past fall, Sarah Carroll, who has decades of experience as a historic preservationist, was appointed the new chair of the LPC, and we've already noticed a difference. In one of her first acts, she shelved the prior chair's plans to change the rules to limit the ability of the public to know about or comment upon proposed changes in historic districts, a plan Village Preservation had led the charge against and implemented a much more sensible plan, preserving the public's role in the process as we had called for. We were also greatly hardened when a, heartened when a rezoning of the site adjacent to the Merchant's House Museum to allow construction of a hotel, which the museum says would irreversibly damage their nearly 200-year-old historic gem, was rejected by the city council. And just last week, the LPC finally heard two landmarks of LGBT history, which Village Preservation had campaigned for for five years to have landmarked. The LGBT Community Services Center on West 13th Street and the former Gay Activist Alliance Firehouse on Worcester Street. <laughs> Village Preservation has made a priority of highlighting and fighting for the history of underrepresented groups, from our groundbreaking campaign to get the Stonewall Inn landmarked and listed on the National Register of Historic Places, to our many efforts to highlight and preserve the history of the women's movement, the African American Civil Rights Movement, and immigration landmarks in our neighborhood. The LPC is scheduled to vote on these two buildings next Tuesday, and I'm confident that they will be landmarked. Village Preservation has also helped lead the charge citywide to get the city to do something about the abuse of zoning regulations to build super tall towers by getting around zoning limits by using phony, empty, mechanical voids which are exempt from zoning limits. The City Council just passed legislation which makes the very first incremental steps in closing that loophole and the state is now considering further measures. We also helped lead the fight to preserve and promote small businesses in our neighborhood. We continued our very popular Business of the Month program where we highlight one unique local business per month nominated by the public and encourage the public to patronize and support them. We've also been a leader citywide in the fight for legislation to help protect small businesses to allow them to remain in their spaces and fairly negotiate lease renewals and to disincentivize keeping retail spaces empty for protracted periods of time. We've also been making great progress in our efforts to advance a special district zoning proposal that would limit the proliferation of chain stores in neighborhoods which want to. And tying together our advocacy for small businesses and historic preservation, earlier this year we released a survey showing that there are significantly lower rates of retail vacancies in landmark sections of the East Village than in non-landmarked areas, illustrating that businesses can thrive in our historic districts and landmarking can be an important part of maintaining a healthy and vibrant neighborhood.
This year, we also made it easier for the public to be aware of proposed changes in your neighborhood and to be part of the decision-making process. Ten years ago, we became the first organization in the city to put applications for changes to landmark buildings in our neighborhood online so the public could see them and know when hearings would be held and how to weigh in, in person or in writing. For years, we've allowed you to sign up for notifications about a particular site or application so you can know when plans are filed or hearings are scheduled. But this year, we introduced a new system where you can proactively sign up in advance for notifications about any future applications for changes to landmark structures anywhere on your block or any block you're interested in. This way, you don't have to just be on the lookout for a particular project nearby that concerns you. You can guarantee you'll be informed of any such application whenever it's filed on any block that you want to be notified about. Hundreds of you have already taken advantage of this new system. So as you can see, we have a lot of balls in the air and a lot of work still to be done. We're still fighting the, a proposed air rights transfer for a new office tower on St. Mark's Place that would expand the spread of Silicon Alley into our neighborhood. We got a unanimous resolution in opposition from the community board, but the well-connected lobbyist behind it has a history of getting what he wants from the city. We expect the mayor will support this one, and so we'll ultimately come down to our local city council member, Carlina Rivera. Stay tuned. We have also been waging a campaign to landmark the interior of the historic White Horse Tavern since it was announced that notorious landlord and convicted felon Steve Croman had bought the building. While the new operators of the tavern have kept, have kept the historic interior intact, which in some cases dates to 1880, with the new ownership, there are no guarantees about the space's future. We've gotten support from our landmarking campaign from Speaker Johnson and every local elected official who represents the area. And we will continue to press our case until preservation of the White Horse Tavern is ensured. <laughs> Village preservation has also helped lead the response to the city's potential rezoning of Soho and Noho, which we fear will serve the interests of big real estate and large universities rather than local residents and businesses. We formed the Save Soho NoHo no Coalition with some of our fellow groups and put forward a series of principles for preserving the character of the neighborhood, criticizing the lack of inclusion in the city's process. Tomorrow night, the city will allow the public the first peek at its potential plans for the area, and you can be sure that we will be there to forcefully advocate for the protection of these historic neighborhoods. <laughs> Finally, yesterday, the city landmarked seven buildings in our neighborhood along Broadway south of Union Square. Normally a cause for celebration, this is also a cause for frustration and disappointment. While none of these designations would have happened without all of our collective concerted efforts to demand that the city preserve this area along University Place, Broadway, and 3rd and 4th Avenues, designation of these seven buildings, which are not currently endangered and are not likely to be in the foreseeable future, falls far short of the protections we campaigned for and that the local council member pledged when running for city council would be a prerequisite for her vote in favor of an upzoning for the mayor's tech hub on nearby 14th Street. Accounting for only 3.6% of the historic buildings in the area we urged be covered by historic district protections, while these seven buildings were landmarked, the nearby St. Dennis Hotel, originally built in 1853, was demolished to make way for a glass office tower to house the kind of tech firms the recent upzoning encourages. More such demolitions and out-of-character new construction in the area will likely continue. But we're not accepting the status quo. We've been sure to call out the mayor and the council member for their failure to protect this neighborhood and for the shady dealings behind the Tech Hub approval. 
We commissioned a study by a no noted architectural historian who previously worked at the Landmarks Preservation Commission, highlighting the area's irreplaceable architecture and history and its vital role in New York's commercial development in the 19th century and its em emergence as the center of the art world in the mid-20th century. We will continue to fight to this, for this area until it has the protections that it deserves. So as you can see, we have much to celebrate and much to continue to work towards. Thank you to all of our members and our supporters for believing in our mission and the cause of preservation, and we hope you'll continue on with us for another year and then some. Please enjoy the rest of the evening, and thank you very much. Um, I don't know about you, but I am so impressed and thankful that our executive director and staff of six people and part-time interns are able to accomplish all that you've seen here. It's amazing. <laughs> now we're going to move to the fun part of the evening. So I would like to uh, request a motion to adjourn the 2019 annual membership motion. I can't see anybody, but I'll assume, there we go. Um, and um, to adjourn the meeting, motion and a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. All right, we'll now transition. You have to watch me slowly make my way across the stage. And then we'll... thank, thank you very much, Art. Right. So, yeah. So now the fun part. I now have the pleasure of introducing Calvin Trillin, our MC for the evening. For those of you who somehow don't know, uh, Calvin is a journalist, author, and villager for over 50 years. He's written regularly for The New Yorker and The Nation for decades, has written dozens of books and short stories, and was a contributor to our book, Greenwich Village Stories. He speaks regularly on television talk shows and documentaries. Let us welcome Calvin Trillin. Actually, by some standards, my book production is somewhat feeble. Uh, I was at a charity lunch sitting at the same table with Isaac Asimov once, who at that point had written something like 515 books. Um, around dessert time, the woman next to me whispered, Mr. Asimov seems very quiet. And I said, while we were making small talk, he wrote a novella. Uh, uh, about 20 years ago, I think, I, my daughters say when I say it was about 15 years ago, it was 40. Uh, I think it was about 20 years ago, New York celebrated the amalgamation of the boroughs to form New York, and as part of that celebration, they put out a pop-up book about some of the neighborhoods and sites and uh, history of the city, and I was assigned to do the village part. Um, that's when I uh, described the village as a neighborhood where People come on the weekends from the suburbs to test out their car alarms. Uh, um, and I, uh, the person I chose to interview was Kenny Shopson. Um, some of you must be aware of, he, sadly he died uh, just last September. Uh, he started uh, with a corner store, which he turned into a restaurant on um, Bedford and Morton, uh, about a 30-seat restaurant that had a menu of 900 items. <laughs> and he was never out of anything. He had a lot of eccentric rules. One of them was that you weren't allowed to copy from what somebody else ordered. Um, <laughs> if you looked over at the neighboring table and somebody was eating something that looked very good and you'd say, what's that? And he would say, well, it's an Egyptian burrito. Uh, and then you say to the waitress, I think I'd like an Egyptian burrito. No copying. I'm sorry. Sorry. Maybe tomorrow. Um, um, but at one point I asked Kenny, 
well, what's the difference, Kenny, between the village and uptown? And Kenny said, I don't know, I've never been uptown. <laughs> uh, well, the answer to my question really is here tonight with the array of awards. Uh, when you take them together, uh, you realize that, that it's the village. Uh, and they, they could only describe the village and, um, and the way it's always been. And there are probably not enough hedge fund managers to change that. Um, there may be. Um, so I'm pleased to present the 2019 Village Awards. Uh, the first awardee is the Christopher Park Alliance. Um, uh, Christopher Park has been a community gathering place for over uh, 180 years, uh, and it's, of course, attached now uh, in people's minds to uh, the Stonewall, uh, with the Stonewall Uprising. I'm sure the Stonewall Uprising was 50 years ago, because Andrew said it was. Um, um, and in 1999, the park, partly because of the efforts of the um, Village Historic Society, um, was put on the National Re Register of Historic Places, uh, but it had fallen in somewhat into disarray. Um, overgrown garden, um, overflowing trash from, compared sometimes to my backyard. Um, uh, and um, in 2012, several community members gathered to resurrect the defunct Christopher Park Partnership into the Christopher Park Alliance and they started out by simply cleaning the park. They had 300 volunteers dedicating thousands of hours to scrape and fix the 150-year-old fence, planted thousands of tulips and other flowers, uh, and the park's revival helped inspire the national effort to make Christopher Park into the centerpiece of the commemoration and celebration of the Stonewall Uprising and the gay rights movement. In June 2016, President Obama proclaimed Stonewall National Monument with Christopher Park as its centerpiece. Uh, for CPA, supporting the park's strong community connections with embracing the national significance is an un un ongoing effort and a labor of love. We are honored to present the Christopher Park Alliance with a Village Award for caring and improving a vital historic park through dedicated volunteer efforts, making it once again a proud centerpiece of our neighborhood and a worldwide celebration of civil rights and social justice. Accepting on behalf of the Christopher Park Alliance, Andre Becker and Jamila, I was told how to pronounce Jamila's last name. I'd like Jamila to come up here and pronounce it. They said deeper Parker's there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it is Jamila, and the last name is DeFrepolez. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> um, well, on behalf of the Christopher Park Alliance, we thank GVSHB, or Village Preservation, for this kind honor. Um, and we've got our crew right up there. Um, one that we share with many individuals and organizations that helped us reclaim the park, including Partnership for Parks, New York City Parks Department, New York Horticultural Society, Abingdon Square Conser Conservancy, Village Alliance, GBSHB, dozens of community volunteers, and local businesses. And yes, it's the local businesses that made the difference for us. They got us up and running. And in making the leap from Christopher Park to Stonewall National Monument, well, for that, we're thankful to uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler, State Senator Brad Hoylman, Council Speaker Corey Johnson, and the Supportive Community Board too, the National Parks Conservation Association, and the National Park Service. Now what started was a, as a simple effort to get some green back into our neighborhood park has taken us on a grand adventure, introducing us to wonderful, generous people and helped us all understand the power of place. Only 0.19 acres in size, Christopher Park isn't much bigger than a postage stamp. 
But working in the gardens, one hears how visitors from around the world marvel as they see for the first time themselves represented in a statue, or their struggle for basic rights commemorated in a national monument, the only one in the entire country honoring the ongoing struggle for LGBTQ equality. This postage stamp has immense power. Whenever something monumental in the LGBTQ community happens, good or bad, Stonewall is where people immediately gather. When the Supreme Court decision affirmed gay marriage, crowds spontaneously appeared. And three years ago, three years ago today, when a gunman killed 40 men, 49 people in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, mourners began to gather in Christopher Park within minutes after the news hit the waves. That's the power of place. Throughout this month, more than four million visitors are expected to come to New York to celebrate World Pride and to visit Christopher Park and Stonewall National Monument. As stewards of Christopher Park, we've decked the garden out in pink triangles to welcome the world to Greenwich Village, to our village. So on a side note, we extend our thanks to everyone out there, everyone in the village who does what we do, either as a park volunteer, as a block committee member, or as a keeper of a tree pit or proud owner of a window box. Through our efforts, we're all keeping the green in Greenwich Village. Thank you. Our next awardee is the Source United Print and Copy Shop. Um, it occurred to me in looking at the report about that, that those of us who have been here for a while have seen the beginning and end of a lot of businesses. Um, video stores, for instance. Uh, we used to have a lot of video stores in the village. Um, and now even the ones that tried to show how smart they were and how dumb the customers were by categorizing films by director. Um, <laughs> looking very weary when you ask how, how, where they were. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> and copy shops, which um, when I was going around the country to do a series of pieces for The New Yorker every three weeks, there weren't any coffee shops except in Utah, because uh, the Mormons used them for their genealogical research. Uh, so we went from zero to practically back to zero, except a few little cluster around NYU. Um, but that did not affect the source United Print and Coffee Shop, uh, which started in 1982 in both printing and copying. The people weren't doing that in those days. Um, one East Villager said that to call the source a copy shop is like calling the Metropolitan Museum of Art someplace where pictures hang. <laughs> that if you wanted to be reassured that creative people still call the East Village home, just spend a few hours at the source. Writers, photographers, artists, and musicians all flock to this tiny service establishment. It's a place where creative folks know that their precious fruits of their labors will be handled with care, sensitivity, and appreciation. Uh, Santo and Margaret Molika, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Molika, I've decided it was Molika, um, uh, are soft-spoken but tough. About 15 years ago, their landlord tried to evict them, even cutting the power off instead of giving up. They ran a generator on the sidewalk for over a year to provide electricity for the store. <laughs> Eventually winning a prolonged legal battle. We are honored to present the Source United Print and Copy Shop for supporting fellow businesses and residents in the East Village since 1982. Accepting on behalf of the source, our owners, Santo and Margaret Molica.
Thank you. Well, it does indeed take a village to get one of these things. Uh, it takes a Margaret Malika putting in her time every day. Yeah. Spitting in the face of the challenges that living with multiple sclerosis brings on a daily basis. It takes a Henry Reininger, his wife, Benet, and his daughter, Goldie, who not only helped us keep our books together, but offered a key piece of advice that helped us win a decade-long battle against a landlord who wasn't too fond of us, we'll say. <laughs> it takes a Polly Eustace, who, uh, after I spoke to all these lawyers who pretty much said, this don't look good, kid, so you better start packing. Uh, she said, well, let's see what we got here, you know, and uh, it started a journey that ended in the Supreme Court in New York with wins all along the way. Yeah. <laughs> It also takes a uh, uh, Marilyn Appleberg, uh, a Jason Burchard, uh, uh, David Leslie, uh, Butch Morris, uh, Larry Fagan, and all the people who came through our doors through the years to give us work to help keep us going. Uh, me and Mark have always uh, kind of subscribed to the Marxist theory uh, put forth by Groucho that, um, <laughs> that we would never join a group that would have us as members. Uh, but in this case, we're not only honored, but somewhat humbled uh, to be part of this group that has done and continues to do so much to try to keep the village the, the wondrous and magical place that it is. And, and I think they deserve a hand for, for what they do too. Uh, I come from a place called the South Bronx. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I went to school around the corner from where I lived, you know, so I would get to go home for lunch. And sometimes my old man would uh, get home from work early and he'd be over there, you know, and we'd, have, we'd talk a little bit. And I remember one time that he told me, he said, you know, son, because he always used to forget my name. You know, he, <laughs> he said, uh, I don't really have anything to give you, but I can tell you these three things that, that, that may help you live a good life. And he said, number one is to have faith in yourself as well as the Lord. He said, number two is to always hope for the best, but be as prepared as you can for the unexpected. And number three is to be charitable to others, and others in turn will be charitable to you. And that's been our business plan this whole time, and I just want to thank you for, for validating it. And in conclusion, in conclusion, I just got to say that uh, we can't think of a better place to have been for the past 37 years or the next 37. So, all right. So viva the village preservation, viva the East Village, and viva East 9th Street. Thank you, take care. Our next awardees are the Brown Foundation and Gluckman Tang Architects. Um, the foundation, um, took a building at 421 East 6th Street, which was originally designed as a substation for Consolidated Edison in 1920. It was converted to a multi-use commercial structure in 1963 and subsequently served as a home and studio of famed artist Walter Du Maria from the 1980s until 2003. In August 2014, the Brown Foundation purchased the building. Richard Gluckman of Gluckman Tang Architects Re redesigned the building that included 7,000 square feet of exhibition space spread across four floors. Many of the historic features, including the landmark north facade and historic brick were retained and restored. Gluckman Tang did extensive renovations on both the exterior and interior of the building, including the restoration and repair of the brick facade. The foundation's inaugural exhibit featured the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat, and drew thousands of people to the East Village. Curated by the Brandt Foundation founder, Peter M. Brandt and Dr. Dieter Buchhardt, the exhibition brought together Basquiat's most important masterworks from the Brandt collection, to, as well as from, excuse me, the light's not good here. Um, Peter Brandt has uh, been collecting Basquiat since 1980s. Don't you wish you had been collecting Basquiat? <laughs> Maybe at the beginning of the 80s. Sure. 
um, and stated, Basque has been cornerstone of the East Village art scene for decades, and to bring the work back to the neighborhood that inspired it is a great privilege. We are honored to present the Brandt Foundation and Gluckman Tang Architects with a Village Award for renovating the former Con Ed substation at 421 East 6th Street and turning it into a magnificent art showcase open to the public. Accepting on behalf of the Brandt Foundation and Gluckman Tang is Richard Gluckman. Thank you, Mr. Trillin. Thanks to you, I still refer to restaurants in a certain part of this country as uh, serving Casa del Maison House cuisine. I love preservation, even though I've been known at times um, to sometimes disagree with preservationists. Kathleen McGuigan, the editor of Architectural Record, described um, our work in this building as creating a remarkably fresh experience that the deft weaving of new with old can be nearly as inventive as starting from scratch. I started from scratch over 40 years ago and preservation has been a critical part of our practice ever since. We take pride in our ability to integrate 21st century building systems into our projects discreetly and appropriately. What we love most of all is making contemporary interventions into historic buildings and historic precincts in a way that respects and celebrates the integrity of both. This project has all of that and more. The resonance generated by the inaugural exhibition of Jean-Michel Basquiat's work into this magnificent building in this landmark neighborhood where the artist lived and worked has been nothing short of, rem of, of remarkable. Thank you, Village Preservation, for recognizing that. And thanks to Peter Brandt for his commitment to honor this building by supporting a new use that makes the building accessible uh, to the neighborhood and who allowed us to preserve the interior architectural detailing as well as the required exterior architectural detailing. And providing two lovely pocket parks on 6th Street and 7th Street signed by Madison Cox. Thank you on behalf of and thanks to the Brant Family Foundation represented by Melissa Sassetti for their strength um, and their stewardship of the building. And thanks to our consultant team, Silman Engineering for Structural Engineering, Altieri for Mechanical Engineering, Flux for the Lighting Design, and Bone Levine for the Restoration of the Building Fabric. Thanks to Eurostruct, the contractors, uh, for an impeccable project. But most importantly for me, thanks to my colleagues at Gluckman Tang Architects, Robert White, our principal in charge, and Edoa Shimizu, the project manager, uh, for their dedication, intelligence, uh, and perseverance towards this project that represents the most rewarding aspect of being an architect in New York City. Thank you again, Village Preservation, for recognizing our efforts to incorporate the ethos, culture, and history of this neighborhood. And as Catherine McGuigan added, as in one more way to make, to make a mark on the city and look to the future. Thank you very much. There, there was a time when Americans liked to make fun of British food. Um, people said that people said that anybody uh, who eats something called uh, mushy peas or uh, bubble and squeak uh, deserves what he got. Um, uh, I um, had a friend who did a, a cookbook of, of British food. She wanted to call it much, much maligned. Uh, the publisher changed that to great British food. <laughs> Sounds sort of like great Episcopalian folk singers. Uh, <laughs> uh, great Jewish hockey players. Uh, 
But then when we got to thinking about it, there's a lot of British food that, that people love. Um, fish and chips, for instance. Um, although the, the best fish and chips I ever had in London, I have to admit, was sort of British, except that the proprietor was Greek and he dredged his fish in matzo meal, uh, <laughs> which works. I tried that in Nova Scotia, it works. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons that we uh, realized that we uh, actually were sort of nostalgic sometimes for British food was Tea and Sympathy, which opened in 1991 on Greenwich Street, uh, uh, Greenwich Avenue. Um, and I realized that, that there were some of the, maybe not mushy peas, but some of, I even for a while had a pang for Marmite. Uh, <laughs> That was going a little too far. Uh, um, tea and Sympathy has been a welcoming everyone from, quote, little old ladies to rock stars and lonely longtime locals to homesick expats. Um, the Nikki, the, one of the proprietors, established a program called Dinner for One More to encourage village elders who might be isolated and alone to have a welcoming place to dine and meet owners. Nikki and her husband, Sean, have started two other neighboring businesses, Carry On Tea and Sympathy, and A Salt and Battery. <laughs> We're gonna forgive them for that title. <laughs> um, the, um, Nikki and Sean are great benefactors of many civil and local causes when donating money, time, or food. They have garnered attention from the media such as BBC and the London Times received accolades from political circles. And they've been visited by the late Dr. Oliver Sacks, and here it says the Queen of England. Um, I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've never seen her in the village, but that means she's not uh, uh, She's sort of an uptown type. To, uh, uh, but, but, but she's the queen. Um, so with those, with those three establishments, they had sort of a British council on, on Greenwich Avenue. Um, we are honored to present Tea and Sympathy with a Village Award for serving as New York's go-to spot for a taste of England and caring deeply for customers in the community since 1991. Sean Cavanaugh Dowsett and Nikki Perry will uh, accept the award. Sorry, folks, Nikki's decided to nominate me to speak this evening, um, so you won't have to put up with her rules. That's always one plus. Um, <laughs> famous for the rules on the door. Um, this is such an honor. Um, you know, we both have a funny accent, and we're not originally from here. Um, you know, I've been in this uh, city for 30 years now. Um, came here on a 10-day job. Uh, came over the brow of the hill towards the Midtown Tunnel, saw the skyline, fell in love with the place. Um, Nikki has a similar story. She was a few years before me getting here and um, fell in love with the place and decided to make her life here. Um, coming from overseas, New Yorkers often get the reputation of being a bit brusque and sort of standoffish and got places to be and things to do and people to see and all that stuff. But uh, I have to say that um, from our experience, uh, we couldn't have been more welcomed and more helped and more felt, made to feel at home amongst the wonderful people that have supported us over the 28 years. Oh, well, actually, it's the 29th year of your awards. This is the 29th year of Tea and Sympathy. And, uh, and we've had such support from our friends and neighbors and um, our elected officials, Eric and Corey and um, 
Senator Heilman and, and so many people that really pulled hard for us when it's hard to keep a small business running in New York City, as I'm sure many of us can attest. Um, but we've been lucky enough and honored enough to have many of the people in this room and a lot of the people in our neighborhood be our friends, our customers, our neighbors. But it's to steal the phrase. I love it. And lovers. Well, maybe not, yeah. <laughs> Listen, we've been, we've been very lucky. I met, I met Nikki in the restaurant. Um, we have 29 staff members that met their life partners in that funny little room, 375 square feet. We've lost count of the number of customers who actually met in there. We're now at the stage where people who met in there, now their kids are bringing in their babies. Um, so maybe there's something in the water, just in case. Um, or in the tea, that could be the answer. Um, but it's, uh, it's just been an honor to, um, to be with the people in this room and our neighbors and the people we get to serve on a daily basis. And uh, all we can really say is thank you so much. Oh, and regarding the Queen, she never came to us, but we did go to her house once. The bitter end uh, opened in 1961, um, which was the was also the year I came to the village. Um, it's remained a vital, iconic music venue. Uh, and listen to some of the people who have uh, performed there: Stevie Wonder, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, Billy Joel, Patti Smith, Neil Diamond, Linda Ronstadt, Etta James, Simon and Garfunkel and Lady Gaga. Um, the owner uh, notes that the venue still attracts up and coming talent and their longstanding open night mic, open mic nights. Uh, my friend Fats Goldberg, the pizza baron, the, uh, the late Fats Goldberg, who actually wasn't fat anymore, but he, he had weighed 320 pounds and lost half of the Fats Goldberg I once knew. Uh, he lost, every, he lost the equivalent of Rocky Graziano in his prime. <laughs> before, before he opened his pizza parlor, he had a, um, a comedy act uh, with a woman named Berkowitz. Uh, he claims he was at the open mic at uh, the Bitter End once. Uh, the act was called Goldberg and Berkowitz. He said, but we didn't do any Jewish jokes. That was part of, that was the joke. Said, so how did they know when to laugh? Um, uh, Fats Goldberg's name is not among the listed of the famous people who have been there. But you can imagine in the changing nature of today's music industry, there's a challenge. Uh, but the bitter end not only survives, but thrives because it's already maintaining an identity as a venue and supporting the live music for all. They intentionally keep prices affordable so that their audience can remain diverse. Uh, some patrons are local and some are tourists, but everyone comes for the experience of a revered, legendary musical landmark. We are honored to present The Bitter End with a Village Award for serving as one of the world's premier music venues, showcasing both the undiscovered and greats since 1961. Accepting on behalf of The Bitter End, owner and manager Paul Rizzo. Not very good at this, so we'll get it out of the way. I want to thank the Village Preservation for the honor of being recognized. Uh, my partners and previous owners over the past 58 years, you had Paul Colby, Kenny Gorka, Fred Weintraub, Dale Lind, Pat Kenny, all contributed to making us what we are today. I have an amazing staff that have been there for forever. Um, Ann Tootie, Evan Kremen, and the, and the bunch. Uh, I want to thank the musicians, not just the big ones like Neil Diamond and Lady Gaga who came back and did some shows, but all the ones who play 
four different gigs every night. Um, they're going to another gig after they play with us. They're the backbone of the music industry in this city. Uh, I want to thank my wife for putting up with the horrible hours that this business brings you. Uh, other people who helped me book the room, they bring a lot of good acts in. The neighbors in our building and around us who have put up with not just Bleecker Street, but a lot of us. <laughs> uh, let's see, I want to thank our landlord for not pricing us out like every other music venue in the city. We're lucky with that. Community Board 2, BAMRA, the 6th Precinct, and all the other bars on the block that keep it what it is. Thank you very much, and I guess that's it. Thank you. Our next awardee is Hetty Jones. Hedy Who, who has a following here. Um, she's a writer, an activist, a teacher, someone who worked for many years for the Partisan Review, and is the former chair of the Penn Prison Writing Committee, and for 13 years ran a writing workshop at the State Correctional Facility for Women at Bedford Hills. She teaches a graduate course in creative writing at the New School and her writing workshop for Mothers of the Lower East Side Girls Club has moved to the H.O.L. Howell Art Gallery. Um, it was here that Hetty wrote 24 books. And she and her husband at the time, Leroy Jones, founded Totem Press. I played basketball with Leroy Jones in, in that park on uh, Hudson, around her, Horatio around there. We called it the Field of Honor. I don't know the real name of it. Um, he scored a lot more baskets than I did. Um, and um, in 2007, plans were announced to build the 22-story Cooper Square Hotel and demolish the 1844 Greek Revival structure at 27 Cooper Square, where Hetty had lived for 45 years. Given Hetty's petite size, it would be easy to call her successful effort to save her home a David and Goliath struggle. Remarkably, her gentle but persuasive stress on the building's age and artistic heritage convinced the hotel's owners, and they opted to spare the building, incorporating it into the hotel. We are honored to present Hetty Jones with a Village Award for her lifetime of poetry, teaching, writing, and activism. Can you see me? <laughs> I'm standing on tiptoe. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks, many thanks for this honor. I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed by the whole thing. It seems that the Village Society for Historic Preservation has its eye on the prize. For those of you unfamiliar with them, they really get around. That's the way I feel. <laughs> As has been mentioned, I teach here at the New School in the graduate writing program. And last year, when I finished my class in activist literature, my chair announced, oh, you're not going to teach that anymore. But here's a new idea. How about a history of the East Village? Well, says I, that hasn't yet been done, so I may as well do it. All I need to do is ask the village historic people. Then, this very morning, I came out of the bank and a guy greets me, this very morning, this morning, a guy greets me on the street with, 
congratulations. So I figure the village society people have already been on the job. And my conclusion to both of these events is if academia knows about you, that's one thing. But if Chase Bank knows you too, you really are arrived. <laughs> so thanks a lot, village society people, and long may you thrive. And on a serious note, for all of you in the audience, do you remember when the city had a lot of signs all around that urged, if you see something, say something? Well, regarding the village, if you know or recognize something that needs to be done, do it. Saying something is good, but doing something, if you can find the time or the wherewithal, is even better. So thanks a lot for coming out. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. I needed a cane for a while, and I got one of those fold-up canes, the big lows. And when you open it, it goes <laughs> <laughs> It's like a magic trick. Uh, and um, I think certain segments of the society would call it a chick magnet. Um, I, I left that Chinese restaurant on 6th Avenue toward the end of the time I had it, and I flicked it out. The two young women were eating there, and they applauded. Uh, I bowed. Uh, each year, uh, Village Preservation presents one special village award, awardee with the Regina Kellerman Award. Regina Kellerman was a village preservation, was village preservation's first executive director and a passionate advocate for historic preservation. The 2019 Regina Kellerman Award will be presented to the estate of Fred W. McDara. Fred McDara was the primary and often only photographer for the Village Voice for decades since the newspaper's inception in 1955 Considering what other people were covering and how little some things got coverage, if Bigdaro hadn't been there, there'd been no record of what happened. He covered the village counterculture, gay rights, women's liberation, the Vietnam War, experimental theater, and other movements centered around the village. Because he, as he noted, they were the most colorful community of interesting people, fascinating places, and dynamic ideas. Nobody captured the dynamism, the energy, the transformative nature of Greenwich Village and downtown in the second half of the 20th century like Fred W. McDarrow did in his photographs. Fred and his wife, Gloria, spent their lives raising their family in the village, participating in protests, and working on historic preservation. Fred died in 2007 at the age of 81. Since then, the estate has promoted the use of Fred's photographs for the cause of preservation. As Gloria said, an image is far more powerful than just words. Gloria is fiercely protective of the village and believes the photographs can and should continue to educate and protect landmarks now and in the future. Gloria said, I hope that the Greenwich Village Historic District gets enlarged, and I hope the village remains an entity, that it doesn't just fade away. We are honored to present the estate of Fred W. McDarrow and a village award for sharing the work of the incredible photograph chronicle of the 20th century downtown life and using that legacy to support worthy causes, including historic preservation and civil rights. Accepting on behalf of the estate of Fred W. McDarrow will be his son, Tim McDarrow. This is my brother Patrick who's here with me. My mother is a little under the weather, but she sends her regards and she says she'll see you next year. Um, 
Before we came up, Sam Moskowitz, who was with the GVSHP, said to me, Tim, family friendly. He knows that my language can be a little colorful. Um, so when I heard family, I'm like, Bonanno family, Gambino family, we're going to have some fun with this. <laughs> and George Carlin flashed through my mind the seven words you can't say on TV. Um, and as I, as I was sitting, uh, I came up with the seven words you can't say at a GVSHP award ceremony. These are seven of the nastiest things, seven of the nastiest words. Carlina Rivera, <laughs> Bill de Blasio, Lou Rudin in Greenwich Lane, Donald Trump, Margaret Chin, and Harry Macklow. <laughs> if any of you were in the audience tonight of those seven people, I'm glad you heard it, and I'm happy to share why I think that after the event tonight. Um, my dad took about 250,000 pictures during his career at The Voice. Uh, a lot of them were the standard things that The Voice covered, Carmine DeSapio, a beam, Andy Warhol, Bob Dylan, but he spent an awful lot of time taking pictures of the village itself. Uh, this, be, this was because he thought that the village was dying. This was before there was a Landmarks Preservation Commission, before there was a Regina Kellerman, before there was an Andrew Berman, and there's gonna be an award name for you one day, dude, no question about it. <laughs> and he was always thrilled uh, that his pictures were able to, to do some good. Uh, and when he, what we see now, uh, Andrew will take some pictures of Willem de Kooning at 827 Broadway, taken of Willem de Kooning in 827 Broadway. And if that can do one little bit to help get that building landmark, then my dad would have been thrilled and we're thrilled about that too. And when you look at these six LGBT sites that are about to be landmarked, you know, Fred had pictures of the firehouse and of Stonewall and of all four of the other sites. And in fact, the village is such a great place. On the cover of the last book, a woman named Hetty Jones, one of the little pictures was one of my dad's pictures. It's a, it's a small world. Um, and the reason the village is so great, uh, we're the last people, so I have the freedom to talk as long as I want, um, <laughs> is when I was little, my parents would walk past places with me and they would go, look, there's the White Horse, that's where our first date was. And I'm like, fucking old people, you know. Um, and now my son, who's a graduate student here at the new school, says the same thing to me when we walk by places and I say, that's where I did this. Um, and just walking here tonight, we walked past a place called the Church of the Ascension down the street. Um, and this Jewish kid went to nursery school there. Um, and there was an afternoon in May of 1970 when my dad was home and he got a phone call saying, please remove your child from the school. There's been an incident on the block. So my dad straps on his camera, bikes up here. He sees the weatherman had blown up the building on 11th Street. He scoops up Patrick. He takes six pictures of Dustin Hoffman and he bikes home. Um, true story. True story. Um, and that's why the village is such an utterly fantastic place because you see everybody, you learn everything, you can really see what's important and what isn't important. The reason that people are coming to the village now for Stonewall 50 and World Pride was because people like Andrew and his crew, starting with Regina Kellerman, created a landmark, a landmark district after the Brooklyn Heights one, obviously. Um, it's extremely important, the work that they do. Uh, none of you in the audience give enough, none of you. Every single person should give more. Um, and, 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 but you're gonna be giving it to another director because we're gonna step back from the photo business now and I'm starting tonight a draft Andrew Berman for mayor campaign. <laughs> Seriously, Andrew, thank you and your staff. You're fantastic. We're humbled and honored to get this. We're humbled and honored that you think these pictures are worthy of helping you out and Godspeed for another 19 years at this. Well, uh, thank you, Tim and Patrick, and thank you to all of the incredible awardees tonight. Thank you to Calvin Trillin for being an incredible host and MC. Uh, and most importantly, thank you to all of you for uh, supporting us. And the evening is not over. Uh, we have a wonderful reception. Uh, you can exit towards the back and to your left. Please uh, stay, uh, enjoy. I just ask the uh, members of the Village Preservation Board of Trustees, if you can all come up to the stage. We have some quick business we have to take care of, and then we can uh, join the party as well. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to see you out there.